We should be live now. I think I've got all the uh, technical bugs sorted out. Hopefully the uh, sound level should be good. I'm expecting you can all probably see me on uh, your end now. So welcome to another installment of MP3's Chat with the Archaeologist. I am the Project Archaeologist, Chester Levosh. And uh, as you can see behind me, starting to get a little bit in the mood for the season. I just had my uh, pumpkin harvest, and so I would like to be talking a little bit about some halloween -y topics this month. Before we dive into that, uh, I do want to uh, remind you that uh, we, have, we have plenty of books and hats and apparel and keepsakes available on our store on our website. So please go to mesoprietapetroglyphs.org and if you like this project, support us by buying some of our merchandise. So yeah, welcome to yet another installment. We'll be talking today about life, death, and the afterlife as seen in indigenous worldviews in the Americas. So this is, as you can tell from my background here, this is in a celebration of the Halloween season. And uh, let's just check. All right, so every once in a while I'm going to pop in over here from, from time to time. Uh, I'll be your uh, jack-o'-lantern for the afternoon. So before we dive in too deeply, I do want to make a disclaimer here. And that is, death is a sensitive topic for many indigenous peoples, something which has been exacerbated by centuries of callous colonial attitudes about human remains and violence against living humans, attitudes which still linger and persist today. And if you don't think it's still going on today, I want to bring up a recent example in which private contractors working on the border wall as it passes through traditional Tohono O'odham territory, that is a Native American group whose traditional lands straddle the national border between the United States and Mexico. Contractors working in this area demolished sacred sites, including known burials using dynamite. This is not only a violation of both federal and state regulations, as well as indigenous sovereignty, but even keeping in mind that the current administration has waived many of these federal regulations for this project specifically, it is nearly unprecedented to remove human remains with high explosive ordnance. It is a massive moral and ethical violation, which is not seen in other projects. While it is preferable to leave human remains in place, even in areas where land is at a premium and disturbance is inevitable, such as in Hawaii, human remains are treated at least with some respect by being removed by hand rather than with heavy equipment and certainly not with explosive ordnance. These kinds of actions damage our relationships with Native American groups and make the archaeology of topics like we're going to address today that much more difficult and that much more contentious. Now, I speak as a scholar, and I do not claim to represent any indigenous groups or their wishes. Furthermore, if you are sensitive to the topic of death, you may wish to not continue watching this video lecture, because that is what we will be talking about today. In the following, I discuss non-Western views of death and the afterlife, but I will not be showing any of the following. Graves, tombs, crypts, grave goods, or human remains. I make this decision out of an attempt to show respect. There are also other topics around the subject of death that I will not be getting into because they can be potentially contentious. 
All right. Now that we got that out of the way, rough outline in no particular order is we're trying to address the question of how do people think about death? And so I'll go through a few of the lines of evidence that we might use as scholars. One is the archaeological evidence, particularly of burial practices. Now this includes both the bodies, the physical human remains, as well as the context in which they're found in. And that context can include physical objects such as pottery, highly valued commodities, etc., other things accompanying the deceased. We can also find lines of evidence in iconography. Images don't necessarily have to expressly portray death, but might instead allude to stories about life, death, the afterlife, as well as uh, provide symbolism through metaphor. Now, these metaphors can often be difficult to identify, and so that's when we have to turn to oral traditions. And so a lot of the evidence that we'll be talking about today, even if it is the material evidence, we know how to recognize it through some familiarity with the relevant oral traditions of descendant communities. Now, examples we're going to cover, uh, and these are, again, not necessarily in the order that they're going to be in the presentation. We'll be talking a little bit about some Native Californian groups. We'll talk about Chaco Canyon. We'll talk about later Pueblo groups who consider themselves descendants of peoples from Chaco. And we'll be talking about Mesoamerica, including Maya. Now, like I said, this is a difficult topic to address. And it's made all the much more difficult by this tension between um, Native Americans and the, and the uh, current political atmosphere, particularly on the national level. So, I for one um, very much appreciate this quote from Ferguson et al. For more than a century prior to NAGPRA, Southwestern explorers, antiquarians, and archaeologists excavated archaeological sites, recovered human remains and associated funerary objects, and curated these materials in museums and private collections. By neglecting to consult with Native Americans, non-Indian archaeologists alienated living people from their ancestors and their histories. These goods were curated as objects of curiosity, as objects of scientific study, and as objects of public display against the wishes of the indigenous communities that were living at the time and that continue to live today. This has contributed greatly to these tensions that I mentioned on the previous slide. Now, NAGPRA, for those of you who may not know, stands for the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. It applies to both human remains and to grave goods, but is constrained to projects that involve federal lands or federal funding. This actually makes it a fairly wide and impacting law, and there are many states with state-level legislation of similar nature to cover those things which are not covered under this relatively narrow scope of federal, um, federally funded or projects or projects on federal land. Now that said, what Ferguson were, uh, at all were getting to is that NAGPRO was introduced to address a problem. And it's that, that same problem that I was talking about, is that colonial attitudes which objectify human remains and the grave goods that accompanied them caused real damage to, uh, to 
living Native American communities. So this legislation was introduced in order to ensure that human remains were relocated rather than destroyed, and that they were repatriated if and when a descendant community could be identified. Well, there are huge politics behind that. You could, you could do an entire college course on. But it covers the human remains, the goods that accompany them, and expressly allows for repatriation to Native American groups. Now this is not preferable. Many groups, such as um, some of those we'll be giving examples from, would prefer that these things remain in the ground and not be disturbed. However, there's a sort of consolation involved in which it is seen as preferable that archaeologists disinter and then repatriate these in a short amount of time, not holding on to them for museum collections, so that they can be reburied properly, instead of the alternative of things like the example that I described happening earlier this year in the construction of the border wall, where a massive moral failing led to the use of high explosives to remo remove human remains from the work area. We should all be disturbed by actions like this. By, by actions which circumvent a law that was already a consolation in order to allow at least the respectful treatment of human remains. And it's for these considerations that I won't be showing any images of human remains, nor of grave goods which accompany them. But don't worry, there will be visual aids throughout this talk. I just have to get these difficult aspects of the subject out of the way first, because they really do make it more of a challenge to be able to address these things. And if we as archaeologists, as scholars, can't address topics such as the way that people conceptualize death in the afterlife, then this creates a break in the ability to communicate these things and allows for more cultural erasure. The more that, that we know and that we can improve public awareness of these topics, the more, the more sensitive people can be to non-Western ways of viewing these things, and, and the more that we can mitigate these sorts of damages. So we'll begin with Hopi, um, with some ideas from Hopi, because these kind of apply, if we project them further into the past, at an interface zone between some of the areas that we'll be talking about. And like I said, there are political implications for any sorts of research that we do, from interpretations to the verbiage that archaeologists use to describe graves, burials, remains, objects accompanying these, and the contexts in which they are found. And there are impacts on claims to land and water rights, which can very gravely impact people's lives, if not handled in a sensitive manner. Some examples of problematic issues are the use of uh, cultural terms preceded by the prefix pre. If we were to say pre-Hopi, that would wrongly imply a lack of ancestry to the people, I mean, a lack of ancestry of the people whose remains are found in what is now Hopi territory. And instead, we should consider that ancestry is not unilineal, and just because that we see these markers of different cultural expressions over the centuries doesn't mean that these folks were not ancestral. Cultural, 
culture changes over time, too. One of the things that has been particularly damaging to Hopi has been, and to other Pueblos, has been this idea that places are abandoned. That when archaeologists encounter ruins, so this is where that verbiage comes in, right? Is that when we use words like ruins, abandoned, it comes with this certain implication that these places are not used and that they lack stewardship. But in reality, many Pueblo groups, Hopi included, still have traditional uses of these places, even if there is no present day residential population. They may be unoccupied, depopulated, but they are not abandoned. They are still remembered. And that is not exclusive to the Southwest either. That is something in a moment we'll touch on Mesoamerica, which is as true down there as it is up here. So some of these solutions are that we should consider that these places with no remaining residential population can still be used, that they still have cultural significance. And honestly, they are a part of the story of peoples like Hopi and other Pueblos. Their ancestors' remains are in these places. And so those physical remains are very much a part of their ongoing stewardship. And it, it is very much a part of their religion that these places, uh, that these human remains in these places sort of um, verify uh, and fulfill a pact with the creator with or with the the spiritual stewards of the of the current world that they are still giving their stewardship to the land and so this is where we also see a distinction in between the spirit and the body at death to the Hopi there is this sort of separation where the 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 sort of soul, the immaterial spirit, leaves with the last breath and goes to an ancestral homeland, while the body remains as a steward of this land, giving it fertility and keeping it. So when we displace these bodies, we are breaking that chain of stewardship. We are making it more difficult for the Hopi and their ancestors to fulfill this pact which is essential to their religion. Now we'll come back to, to Hopi, but I kind of want to jump over to Mesoamerica, and I'll be doing a little bit of jumping around uh, throughout these videos, so uh, please don't get uh, too much whiplash as I do that. So, first we'll talk about Mesoamerica, because as I mentioned, just because a place is not occupied does not mean that it does not have spiritual significance, such as is the case with the classic period monumental centers in uh, the homeland of the Maya. So, these, one could call them city-states, were um, very common throughout southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and I believe a, a part of El Salvador. At one point, many of these centers, like you see on the, on the right side of the screen, this is El Castillo in Belize, these places had large populations which were not necessarily inhabiting the monumental centers at the time of a colonial contact. However, in places like El Castillo, Tikal, Copan, well, Tikal is in Guatemala, Copan in Honduras, and uh, Chichen Itza in southern Mexico, these places still show, they still had cultural use then, at the time of contact, and they still have cultural use now. And I know 
it's difficult to talk about these things in the time of COVID when, when tourism is way closed down. But in normal times, if you visit these places, you're quite likely to see indigenous Maya engaging in traditional cultural religious ceremonies at these places. So this is something which just continued on in the centuries since the close of, well, Chichen Itza is post-classic, but you know, the rest of these examples I've given are classic period. So ending somewhere around 900 to 1000 AD. So how do these relate to the underworld? Well, first, we've got that ancestral connect connection. We have places that people are returning to, in part because there are people in the ground. There are people inside of these monuments. When on top of a large mound, there may be a temple, and inside is an earlier version of that, and that, that earlier version is terminated with a burial, such as is the case with what is called uh, the Rosalia in uh, Copan in northern Honduras. That was an earlier stage of a temple on the top of a platform that was decommissioned, presumably around the time of the death of a particular ruler of Copan, who was then interred inside of the Rosalia, and then the platforms were built over top of that, and a new temple built on top. So I will not show these interior temples because, again, I am avoiding showing any sorts of tombs in, in, in this talk. Now, such as is the case for some subterranean chambers, too. We see the entrance to a cave on the left here. This is Aktum Tunich Muknal in... Um, I believe this one is also in Belize. And this was a sacred cave. And this is where we get from that, uh, that tomb inside of, of, of a pyramid, if you will, the tomb inside of one of these large monumental structures to the underworld. Because these structures, and especially these spaces inside, which then become closed off during later construction, are seen very much in the same way as places like this cave. So this would be considered an entrance to the underworld, or Shibalba. So too would the sort of famous cenotes. Far, far in the back, there are human burials. And this was actually, a few years ago, closed off to visitation because visitors were beginning to impact those human burials in a very negative way. But Shibalba, this underworld, as seen by, by entrances into the ground, like caves and cenotes, this features heavily in a sort of cultural origin story of the hero twins, the story known as the Popol Vuh. And I don't have the time in this talk cover the whole of the Popol Vuh. But these places, these entrances to the underworld are seen as integral to how a culture is defined, how Maya, how Mayan identity is defined. And also it shows that this barrier between the world of the living and, and the, the spirit realm the underworld is also, in some places, at least permeable, a concept which in archaeology we call an axis mundi, a uh, sort of way in between the worlds. Both, both a, a structure like this and a cave like this would be considered axis mundi, and one could potentially enter the underworld, Shibalba, through such places. And so there's a similar concept happening among Hopi in the Southwest. So to my, to your left side of the screen, um, we have the Grand Canyon. 
And this is considered an ancestral place to the Hopi, even though it is somewhat outside of the, the territory, which is now the Hopi Reservation. The Grand Canyon, or its, uh, its tributaries, include uh, an ancestral place of emergence, Sipopuni, which was the place that Hopi emerged into the current world. And it is the place that 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 soul, that spirit, that leaves the body with, with the last breath returns to. So the process of life and death is, I hesitate to use the word cyclical, but there, there is a sense of returning, of, of returning to an ancestral place of origin. And so also this means that deep ancestral time, the, the time before the ancestors of the Hopi emerged through Sipopuni into the current world, is also sort of implicitly tied with the spirit realm and the underworld. This is important when we think about landscapes in, in archaeology, because we can't just say that things, places with construction and places littered with artifacts are, we can't say that those are the only places that are significant. In fact, you may not necessarily always find evidence, but that doesn't mean that it's not an ancestral place. And it doesn't mean that it's not an important place. When you have a place like Sipopuni, it is absolutely essential that this place not be impacted because doing so would impact people's access to the realm of the ancestors into the spirit realm. Such as is what happened to Paiute of southern Nevada when Yucca Mountain, which is now in Nellis Air Force Base, was impacted by nuclear testing. The place is too radiologically active to have human vegetation and is in fact a proposed storage site for radioactive materials. It would be possibly one of the largest such disposal sites in the world, deep under Yucca Mountain. Of course, it creates a problem. If you're storing radiological materials that take thousands of years to decay enough to become safe for human visitation, then you're impacting people's ability to access the spirit world. So I, this is a part of why it's very important to identify these places in order to do good consultation and, I mean, imagine if you couldn't visit Jerusalem, that would be impacting to many millions of people. So it's true for places like the Grand Canyon and unfortunately like Yucca Mountain. So now we're going to flash over to Chaco Canyon, because Chaco Canyon is yet another place considered ancestral to the Pueblos, Hopi included. We do have archaeological evidence of burials at Chaco Canyon. Again, I will not be showing the images, nor the drawings of the burials, nor will I be show showing you the rooms that these occurred in. But here is what some of the... Chaco Canyon is very much monumental construction, and here is what some of it looks like multi-story pueblos whose architecture is built of stone and would likely have been plastered over. One room in particular, room 33, contained an exceptionally large number of burials, one of the earliest of which was an exceptionally rich burial. One of the things that we can learn in archaeology is inequality and access to power. And we certainly have evidence of that at Chaco Canyon in that room on a level which we don't see occur in the southwest after the collapse of Chaco Canyon. So we can learn a lot about the lives of people through death uh, and through the evidence of death but also the ways in which people are buried kind of give clues about 
potential clues about how they conceptualize the afterlife. When a person is buried with, with riches and goods, we need to consider why that might be. Now, is that to take these out of circulation? Is it so that that wealth accompanies them and reinforces their power and status in the afterlife? So, Chaco is a place where we find this evidence. But we also have to be careful when addressing this and when talking about this place. Because there's ev other evidence that we find associated with some of these human remains that can be highly contentious. And while we can have academic discussions about what some of the other social implications might be, those academic discussions also have a lot of fallout for the descendant communities today. And if we're not careful about our phrasing, about the context in which we discuss these things, there can be real social fallout uh, leading to settler communities further othering already marginalized indigenous communities living today. And so I'll be skipping over some of those topics. But Chaco is a powerful place. And there are remains of ancestors of no doubt many of the different ethno-linguistic groups that we now find in the Southwest that either were interred at Chaco or may still be interred at Chaco. We should also consider that Chaco was likely a multi-ethnic community. And so there may not be necessarily one way in which remains were treated and certainly not if that sort of multi-ethnic composition of the uh, populace, whether seasonally temporary or otherwise, um, it, it, it may show inequalities between these groups as well as individuals. And it may also show some of the differences in religious beliefs about life and death between some of these groups. So, do we have iconographic evidence at Mesa Prieta? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. There's a few talking points that I have next to me, and a few that I'm not showing. Because, honestly, a lot of what we have is on private land, and I may not necessarily find it a good idea to give too much attention some of these things that are on private land. But we do have a few examples, not shown, of upside down figures, of human figures whose heads seem to be pointing downward uh, in orientation to the rest of the images on the panel, or in orientation to the panel itself as it relates to the ground. Do these represent death? Well, maybe, but probably not. There's so many symbolic levels to, to such things as that, and it, it, death becomes simply one of the many ways in which we can speculate on how to interpret this. But there are other interpretations as well that we glean from archaeological evidence of other adjacent areas, such as that upside-down orientation representing an entry into the spirit realm during an altered state of consciousness. So these might be ritual specialists. If you remember our talk from last month, these might be ritual specialists who are in an altered state in which they have entered the spirit realm and will return to the realm of the living probably within a few hours. So there may also be constraints on how these panels are made based on how one might access them. And if someone to put a panel on a particular surface might have to lean over upside down, that may change the orientation of the images that they make. So that's another consideration that we should make. And there may not necessarily be an implication of access to the spirit realm at all. 
Now there are other cues. If you'll notice to, yeah, that one. We have an image of a flute player. Now, if you remember that that story of, you know, with, with the Hopi at the at death, the the one person becomes essentially two forms. There's the physical form and and the soul, and the soul leaves with the last breath of life. And this joy, in, uh, so that that last breath, that soul that goes with the last breath then becomes charged with, say, bringing, bringing the rains. And it's associated with clouds. So a person might be buried with a cloud on their face. Well, what does that have to do with flute players? Sometimes flute players are called cloud blowers. Why? Because at the end of the musical instrument, there is a cloud. Sometimes, not always. So there's a sort of relationship between the iconography we see among the Tanoan Pueblos, such as, you know, around, uh, around this area, and the uh, oral traditions we hear among other Pueblos, like Hopi. There is an association between the flute players and the soul. We also have, um, you know, other iconographic cues and contextual cues. So over, over here, we've got a two-horned serpent, which is uh, quite likely a mythological or deity figure, from this perspective seeming to emerge out of the crack in a rock right in front of it. And there's, of course, the seam in between these rocks. This is something that we actually see a lot, is images especially of uh, potentially, potentially mythological figures emerging from the cracks. So this would imply that the cracks, the, the spaces below the rocks, below the boulders, are in fact entrances to the underworld, much as we saw with the, the cave Aktun Tunichel Muknal in the Maya heartland. So, there are some other cues. Yeah, there are some there. Of course, death might arise during conflict. And we have lots of what we would call martial imagery on the mesa, such as a shield bearer with a weapon depicted next to another weapon. But this doesn't necessarily depict death. And we have very few instances of depictions of death in association with violence. So largely, that would seem to be taboo, with only a few instances in which the taboo is broken, and those are m most likely socially significant in the reason why that taboo might be broken in that case. But for the most part, it seems taboo to depict the bodies associated with warfare, even if there are depictions of the warriors. And finally, we have this. This is called a cloud terrorist person. Again, more associations with mythological figures. But also, if you think about the association of clouds with the spirit realm and with the ancestors and with the spirits of the ancestors, then we should take a hard look at images like this and consider that there may be some kind of connection or association. This is what I'm talking about when I say there may be layered metaphors involved. Now I'd like to switch to an example from some of my previous work. You may recognize the slide behind me. And I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll vanish from the screen here for a moment. You may recognize the screen behind me from the archaeoastronomy talk a few months ago. This is of a petroglyph site in the Mojave Desert. And why it was significant in the archaeoastronomy context is because I could pretty firmly associate the depictions here with celestial objects. So if you take a look at the constellation Orion, and then here is what I've argued is 
a depiction of the Shoshone version of the constellation Orion. Excuse the sounds outside. Um, if you'll notice, stars line up. So the main stars of the belt line up with the upturned tail and legs, this big horn sheep here. The upturned tail in the most prominent sheep lines up with the stars in the dagger. And then the feet, the, the hind feet with Saif. Rigel with the snout. So you can see swept horns coming back. You can even see Betelgeuse depicted. This dot would be one of the hunters in the oral tradition. Also, we have a depiction of the Milky Way. If you see right here, the background is slightly lighter. And that's because that's where the Milky Way comes, right by the constellation Orion. And that's where this line is right here. That line continues across this room to engage with these, which lead to this row of florets. So this is the flowery path. The flowery path continues up across the room. And you've got two bands, because there is a dark band in the middle of the Milky Way. So you see two light bands with a dark band in between. That's the, the interstellar dust. And then that ends in the constellation Orion. So all of this lines up. Well, what does that have to do with anything? According to archaeologist Jane Hill, this is a story of the Milky Way uh, from Southern California Udo Aztecans, which would include the, um, the Shoshone, whose traditional territories include where this site is in the Mojave Desert. Well, it is above, sorry, it is above that you and I shall go, along the Milky Way you and I shall go, it is above you you and I shall go, along the flower trail you and I shall go, picking flowers on our way you and I shall go. This is the flower trail, it is the Milky Way. When it says it is above you and I shall go, that is an alluding, alluding to where do you go after death, along the dusty trail flowery way, the ancestral road, which is the Milky Way. So this, and this is something that we'll touch on in a later slide too. This is a pro part of a broader pattern in religious beliefs in Western North America and Northern and Central Mexico. We also have so that shows this association of the heavens with the deceased. Now here is another oral tradition from Southern California. And these are lines from a Capeno creation story, um, or the, the song, rather, that accompanies a Capeno creation story. And it's very powerful for a number of reasons. So Coyote is waiting among a crowd that is mourning the death of Mukat, who is a sort of creator figure. Mukat's body is being cremated, and so this story, we believe, is what gives license for some of the groups in Southern California to cremate. It doesn't mean that all of the deceased were cremated, but we do see cremation burials among peoples who share in this story and among their neighbors. Yeah, it's also very powerful in that it emphasizes the pervasiveness of death. Since the embodiment of creation, Mukat himself dies. So Coyote's waiting among the crowd for an opportunity to steal Mukat's heart from the fire. And the line is, from there fire went on its journey, from there fire blooming. Old Coyote from there listened, old Coyote from there it was blooming. You have this other association now. So we had the ancestral path that was the flowery way along which you and I shall go, right? Now we have, we have flowers associated with the death of Mukat in the funeral pyre and that the fire was blooming and thus Mukat's heart was blooming. This is significant for another reason too. And that is what we call the flower world. 
So the flower world is an idea originally proposed by the now late Jane Hill, um, who noticed this parallel in uh, religious songs, stories, and iconography of many groups throughout, especially the southwestern United States, through northern Mexico and into central Mexico. This includes groups like the Aztec, Yaqui, Huichol, Tohono O'odham, whose ancestral well, whose ancestors' remains were dynamited, remember, from the beginning of this video. It also includes many of the Pueblos, and we see elements of this, but perhaps not the whole suite of religious beliefs among California groups, such as in the Campeño song, uh, and we see elements among the Shoshone, as specifically illustrated by that archaeo-astronomical observation of the Milky Way and the constellations which name it. So this is a shared set of symbolism that is invoked in song and poetry as well as in the Southwest painted on Kiva murals uh, and, and included in other forms of visual culture otherwise known as artistic expressions. Flowers would then be associated with the spirit land. Remember Mukat's heart bloomed as, as he was cremated, um, or the fires bloomed, and that the Milky Way was a flowery path, right? This ancestral road is the flowery path. So flowers are associated with the spirit land, as well as with the spiritual aspects of living people. So associations with flowers can give someone sort of spiritual prowess, Flowers also represent vitals, like the heart, right? Um, and in some iconography that we see in Mesoamerica, flowers can be depicted coming out of the mouth. So uh, that, that association of spiritual, uh, spiritual energy with breath and with life. So, spirit, uh, so one's spiritual prowess is actually kind of associated with life. In, in an interesting way. For those who um, whose songs include flower world symbolism, flowers burn and fires bloom, right? So there's a switching because it's a very colorful world, the flower world. The spirit world is full of vibrant colors. Flowers have gendered implications, including female beauty and fecundity, as well as male strength and spirituality. So the flower world is not just something of the past. It is something that we see today. You may be familiar with Dia de los Muertos and the very colorful, vibrant, and often floral imagery on the very iconic sugar skulls. Um, you also notice the, the inclusion of flowers in ceremonies. And in some places, flower petals will be scattered along roadways and along pilgrimage trails on the Day of the Dead. This is a continuation of this, uh, uh, the expressions of the flower world persisting today among people who practice either indigenous religion or Christianity. And this is another example of <laughs> sort of how almost paradoxically, you know, as we talk about the dead as stewards of the land of the living, as, you know, we, we talked about uh, the, the, the fires on the heart blooming, that death is a part of this cycle of life and that even the flower world the, the the world of the ancestors the world that was where poets and warriors went is also a world of the living today so that's about all that we have time for um our uh, references list is a little bit shorter than usual and uh, 
But yeah, I hope that um, yeah, I hope that these are at least a good start. If uh, you want to learn more about this, there's a lot written out there, but it's difficult to sort of um, stay sensitive to these topics. So I've tried to constrain this list also to uh, references that I think are sensitive, um, at, at least sensitive enough for a public live stream. Uh, we do have a few minutes for some, some questions here. So... I'll, uh, uh, hold on, I'm, I'm trying to turn my face back on here. Here, there we go. And I'm back. All right. So um, I'll start from the, the top. Um, A. Crane says, perfect topic and love the spooky pumpkins. Thank you. Um, in your opinion, why aren't we hearing about these violations in the news? I see things, I see things like destroyed burial grounds in the news as a blip, but never real outrage or coverage. That's a good question, and I don't have a good answer for it. Um, you know, I think a part of it is because because of the marginalization of these communities. Uh, Native communities tend to be small and disperse and um, were often relocated to very marginal lands and you know, often are not very economically empowered. So I think all of these social issues play into um, not necessarily, not that people are expressly ignoring these things happening, but that it's easy for them to get overlooked. Um, Especially when, you know, when we have topics happening on a, on a national level or on an in, international level. Um, why is it this bigger news? Is there anything be, being discussed or strategized in your archaeology community to help bring more awareness to these horrible atrocities and failings to the public? Well, this is a step right here. Um, obviously, we don't have as wide a viewership on this channel as, um, you know, say a national news source. But I do see a lot of archaeologists speaking out. And I think, you know, overall, even if we have regressive moments, we, we still have overall made a lot of forward progress in recent decades. Uh, NAGPRA was the culmination of decades of progress, and there was already movement it's not that NAGPRA came out of the blue. NAGPRA was the culmination of um, a, a push for better ethics and consultation that, that was preceded by demonstrations of what eventually became codified in the law that we now call NAGPRA. Um, we also see a greater involvement, especially in the last 20 years or so, of uh, indigenous people becoming archaeologists. And in that way, they are both respected as scientists and uh, are also liaisons with, um, with their own communities. And so, I mean, like, this, this increases awareness. And I think that there, there really has been a broader move um, towards reducing how frequently these things happen. Um, so... What can we do to help shame this administration, increase sensitivity, and support the indigenous communities more in project, protecting these sites and their, and their culture? Um, that's, that's another uh, good question. Um, I would say, you know, write your, your state and your federal, well, your state and your national senators, uh, your, your representatives in the House. When you hear of a project happening, when you hear of a move to waive compliance laws, you know, write them and say, I don't think this is appropriate. Um, they, they do have some sway to, to, to help alter these decisions. You know, an, another thing that we can do is, you know, um, yeah, I mean, Sometimes you feel powerless in, in, in these situations like the 
uh, like the recent ones. But uh, we do have we do have some advocates out there, and um, you know, honestly, bringing attention to these things, writing your lawmakers and saying, "I don't think this is appropriate." That can make a difference. Um, yeah, that, that can make a difference. So, uh, well, and, and, and of course, you, you get folks like me, and, and I'm obviously trying to be, I'm trying to be an advocate for ethical practice, even though, as I said, I can't represent a Native American community, but um, we, we do have people who uh, can be liaisons, can make that contact. And then uh, Paulo Lazar asks, will this be archived? Uh, yeah, Paulo, this will be archived on our YouTube channel, uh, as usual. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I don't want to leave, I don't want to leave on a bad note. I know, I know there, there are definitely social Im issues that are impacting right now. Um, and there are any number of, of, of ways that you can get involved in, it, in discouraging uh, these things. I have seen protests occurring uh, recently in, in California, um, nonviolent protests about specifically the, the border wall construction and the waiving of federal regulations. Um, you know, like I noted with the uh, with consultation with the Hopi, even though it would be preferable that human remains are left in place and not disturbed. I mean, that's not just true for the Hopi. That's true in my experience with the Native Hawaiian community. That's that's true broadly, but you know. So you, okay, that would be best option. That would be option A. But if impacts are going to happen, to have someone like an archaeologist who can respectfully handle the remains, and then will repatriate the remains. We do have an old guard of folks who are resistant to repatriating remains. And I'm not going to name names because that's not the point here. But more of us, especially those of my generation who have now grown up with NAGPRA. All of our education in archaeology has been in the you know post NAGPRA era or post the passage of NAGPRA, so we get it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's so when a project does go through and impacts are going to happen, I know it increases the expense of a project to exhume the remains and repatriate them. But that also allows the the project to go forward without such a, you know, moral shortcoming. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess don't take shortcuts <laughs> and, and discourage people from taking shortcuts. Um, yeah. And uh, Debbie Flowers said another great talk. Thanks to MPPP. Thank you. And, and thank you about the hat. Um, and Amy says, uh, thank you for sharing and answering my questions. I learned so much and appreciate you talking, taking the time to help us understand. Thank you, Amy. And then I do, I do want to leave you on because I just, uh, I just like this slide here. The, uh, remember that life, death, and the afterlife in, especially in indigenous American religions, as far as we know, often are all part of one cycle, that um, there is this constant connection with life and renewal associated with, with death, like we see in Dia de los Muertos. And I can't leave off on any brighter, more colorful, more encouraging set of images than here. So, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk, and as always, have a great weekend, and I'll see you on the next one. <laughs>